and this is Doug from Greenpeace USA. So, hi Doug. Thanks for joining Good us morning. today. Very Absolutely. excited to have you here. Um, so, we're going to just get straight into it. So, can you start by introducing uh, who you are and who your organization is and just tell us a bit about you? Absolutely. Uh, so, my name is Doug Crable. Uh, I use he, his pronouns. I'm based on uh, unceded Piscataway, Kanoe tribal land, otherwise known as Baltimore, Maryland, here in the U.S. Okay. And I am the Director of Data and Business Intelligence for Greenpeace USA. Um, Greenpeace, uh, many people have heard of as one of the older, continually um, going environmental groups. Um, mm -hmm. Our mission, along with 26 other national regional organizations uh, around the world, is basically to bring about change using nonviolent direct action, using supporter engagement, using pressure on politicians and corporations. Um, and we just passed our 50th year. So it's been a, wow. a, a real joy to be here. Okay, great. And you've been with the organization for a few years now. Um, Just oh. about four, yeah. Yeah, nice. Okay. And you're doing, so you are the Director of Data and Business Intelligence, according to the LinkedIn stalking that I have done. Right. Um, so can you talk a bit about how that kind of uh, feeds in, what the role is and, and what your sure. team's part plays? Sure. So we have a 10-person data team that's mm -hmm. responsible pretty much for all data and analytics throughout the organization. Um, in a lot of non-for-profits, you'll find the data team underneath the fundraising team, like mm -hmm. kind of wholly owned by fundraising. We're a little bit different. We're centralized, so fundraising is obviously probably our biggest client. But we also right. serve we also serve other needs within the organization, such as budgeting, forecasting. Um, we help with mapping and voter pro uh, voter programs. Uh, we help with campaigns work. So I've got. I'm very, very lucky to be, you know, the, the head of a very talented group of people um, that just do amazing work. Wow. Okay. And in terms of, say, how you kind of got there, so you, you started out as a software developer a, a, a few years ago? Very um, many years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, the, in the early days. So. Okay. What was your language of choice? Oh, gosh. In college, it was Fortran and Pascal believe it or not, which uh, <laughs> for you young people out there, uh, it's on Wikipedia. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it grew then mostly the Microsoft suite, um, things like Visual Basic, C Sharp, um, and then into when I was still doing some of that work, uh, JavaScript, um, a little bit of Python. But my career took the direction of going towards data strategy and data analytics mm. about probably 10 years ago or so. Um, okay. I just found that more interesting. and. I like the development side of things, but um, you know the data side of it for me is really the more exciting part at this point. What is it about the data side that is kind of of interest to you? Well, because it can be so multi-purpose, um, and data is also very misunderstood. I think, um, okay. especially, but not exclusively to non-data professionals, right? So, yeah. <laughs> what is data? What do we do with it? I mean, people think that it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I'd like to, a little bit later about this whole concept of big data and how misinterpreted, how misinterpreted that can be. But yeah, so I find it really interesting that you can take so many different approaches to it at once as opposed to software development, which is really like, we have this thing we need to get done. It needs to be built this way. It needs to work. It needs to do all these functions. So. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so you went, so you did a, sort of started out as a software and kind of you went hard into the data um, mm -hmm. sort of in the last few years. You obviously had a stint, again, LinkedIn, creepy stalking. You had a stint as a, as an actor or as a artist. This is true. This yeah. is true. I've been uh, a proud member of Actors' Equity, which is the U.S. stage union for, I think, 12 years now. Um, okay. So I, I mix in plays when I can. Um, it's harder as you get older. It's harder to get up the energy yeah. to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> work all day and then hit a rehearsal, um, but still once in a while. Yeah, I can uh, I can fully imagine that. And you did some voiceover work, so yeah, like we said earlier, we did some digging into uh, IMDb <laughs> and found your your Randis character. So oh my gosh, that was uh, in the mid '90s, I think. It was um, an Amer it was an English language dub of a Japanese um, robot based animation series. Um, uh. My character is a, a huge robot that dies in the first episode. Oh, okay, so... I, I think I had about <laughs> six lines um, in this deep mechanical voice that I won't even try to replicate oh. uh, for, for fear of humiliation. Um, but no, I've also done uh, a lot of uh, book narration. I was a public oh, nice. radio host for uh, seven or eight years uh, there, so I really like that part of it as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was the Genesis Survivor is the name of the show. That That's it. 
that That's we did it. the digging on. Yeah, it looked uh, it looked pretty interesting. <laughs> so and then kind of back into software, presumably the you know the short time as a giant robot was <laughs> fulfilling, but uh, not quite there. Right, um, it didn't didn't pay the bills. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, We've all so, been yeah. big, big robots. But yeah, yeah. So, and then back into software and you worked um, sort of, and then like you say, you went into the kind of data side of things. So I've got my notes. That's why I keep looking away. Um, so that was at Frontstream. Yeah. Although before that, I was a developer at uh, the Housing Investment Trust for the AFL-CIO here in the States. And that's okay. a nonprofit labor organization which builds low income and middle income housing hmm. in places where it's very badly needed. Um, I was kind of a one person uh, software developer shop. Unicorn. Um, so I was the data data architect, uh, the SQL developer. I was everything. So I think that was where I really made the turn. And that's also where I really decided that my heart was in the labor nonprofit space. And that's where I was going to stay. Yeah, I was going to say, was that the that was the first role that was kind of in that nonprofit space. I think once you've worked, even on the fringes, so we, obviously, we're an agency, we do tech for good. I've been here for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, prior to this, I worked in subprime finance, which ah, is yeah. like the bad kind. Um, <laughs> I think once you've worked in this space, it's, it's pretty, it's a difficult one to, to leave. Absolutely. I mean, there are sacrifices. Um, you know, yeah. people, my, my team... <laughs> I always tell them you could be making more money somewhere else, but yeah. please, please stick around because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're really making a difference. Um, yeah. You know, and we see it a little bit every day, whether it's in the fundraising side or on the campaign side. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if, I think if you're interested in that space to then go to Greenpeace is pretty, it's, it's one of the big ones, definitely. Um, yeah. That must have been quite an incredible transition. It was a it was a bit of a dream come true, honestly. Um, and I tell people this story, and I don't know if they believe it. In the late 1980s, a record album came out okay. to benefit Greenpeace, um, specifically the whaling campaign, and it had all these artists that I liked, a lot of UK artists, uh, Nick Kershaw, the folks. And I bought it when I was 17 or 18 or so, and I was just fascinated by it. And I'm like, what is this Greenpeace? And that's when I started finding out about them. And then, oh. who knew, uh, you know. 30 odd years later that I would actually go to work for them. So yeah, nice. Been, nice bit of, nice bit of kismet. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. And so you've been there just under four years now. And are there any sort of uh, particular examples that kind of stand out of how you guys have used tech within the organization and kind of results that you'd be happy to share, like interesting insights? Absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, the fundraising program that we have is pretty massive. Um, as you would expect, it's on the level of scale of some of the other large nonprofits. Um, and it's very multifaceted. We have a digital arm, we have a direct mail campaign, we do telemarketing. We also do Canvas, and that was a very particular challenge for us, obviously. We had one of the largest Canvas programs, and if people aren't uh, familiar with the terminology, it's where we go door to door. Yeah. Uh, the nice folks you see in the street with the bib wow. saying, hey, have you got a moment? Um, yeah. <laughs> which I admire those people so much. Uh, it's not yes. something I could do very easily. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, COVID forced us to shut down our Canvas program. And that was a, a, a massive part of our sustainer program. And very sadly, we had to actually just cut that program and, wow. and lay some folks off. So it really presented a fundraising challenge. How do we, how do we very quickly pivot? Yeah. To, to other fundraising channels and to make that work and what sort of data do we need to figure out what our strategy is. So my analytics head, who is an amazing, talented uh, young woman, um, put together a whole new package of key performance indicators. She totally redid our forecasting modeling so that they could look at it a lot quicker. Uh -huh. You know, normally you look at reforecasting maybe once a year, twice a year, maybe once a quarter. Yeah. We started doing that monthly. So folks could see pretty quickly if something was working or wasn't working. I'm simplifying a bit. There was more nuance to sure. it than that, but, but that was the key. On the non-fundraising side, a couple of the really exciting things we've done with data. One was um, when the embargo against Russian oil took effect, we discovered, we weren't the only ones, um, newspaper reporters found this out too. We discovered that a lot of tankers, um, Russian tankers and others, were kind of covering their tracks. Oh. They were doing something, and I, I won't pretend to detail the technology, but sure. equivalent to a transponder in an airplane, they were essentially turning it off Wow! so that it couldn't be tracked that they were bringing this Russian oil to ports in the United States. Um, so we did a lot of mapping work with that, uh, worked with a great group called Marine Traffic 
which is the state of the art in terms of um, tracking marine traffic, mm. um, and put together some maps and contacted journalists and, and again did some public shaming of oil companies for, for this nonsense. Nice. Um, we're doing a similar effort, a bigger effort that's going to come out this summer, which I can't give too much away <laughs> about, but it's a similar effort only on a larger scale and having okay. to do with um, liquefied natural gas. Wow, okay. So well, those were two. The other example I can point to is we have normally been a non-political group. Um, mm -hmm. Greenpeace does not give money to candidates. We don't okay. support individual candidates, even though we really push politicians to do the right thing. Sure. Um, one thing we did do in 2020 and 2022, though, was attempt to uh, a get out the vote effort, like a voter contact program, where okay. we would target voters in particular districts. We would have letters written and printed up, and we would have this army of volunteers that would hand sign and hand mail all the letters. Um, and that was a, a, a pretty, it took us three weeks to spin up that effort, which is pretty amazing considering we had to assemble all the data, yeah, yeah. figure out how to build those PDFs, figure out how to track the results and all of that. So that was uh, kind of an all hands on deck moment for the data team. And was that just getting people to encourage, encouraging people to just vote? In, in races that were particularly uh, important. And naturally we contacted folks that we thought would have alliance with us, although we want everyone sure. to vote. Voting should be, uh, you know, like it is in most other countries, it should be something that's, uh, you just go out and do it. I, I, I never know why Americans are reluctant to, to go yeah. out to the voting booth. But anyway, that was something that we, we dove into and we're going to continue doing that, um, okay. I believe, moving forward. Nice. And you said, so there's a sort of larger scale um, piece that you can't quite talk about at the moment. So, um, so we won't pry too much on that. Um, but you said about kind of you act as like a central service, so within Greenpeace, so you're kind of, you serve fun, uh, the fundraising team and others as well. Do you guys presumably also provide data for organizations outside of Greenpeace and, and journalists or? Yeah, when, when, when asked for sure. Um, the tanker work is an example of that where we were, we were able to provide some pretty detailed and, and supportable evidence of what was going on. Um, we share data with smaller groups. Um, you know, we we don't share data about our supporters. Sure, we don't, of course. We don't we don't send people names. We don't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you email Greenpeace, you're not. I mean, you're likely going to get contacted by someone similar, but it's not because we gave it to them. Yeah, of course. We we feel pretty strongly about that. Nice. But we do share supporter data in aggregate because it really helps other groups figure out what their donor base can be and what their supporter base can be. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot of internal analytics about our own supporter base. Um, and you know what we found throughout the environmental space is that it tends to be older, mm -hmm. um, tends to be female. Yeah. And so I think one of the challenges that data is going to help us face, and along with a lot of other groups if they're facing the same issue, is how do you diversify that supporter base? Yeah. How do you find out where people are that want to meet you in this space but just we're not approaching the right way or, mm. you know, not appealing to the things that are really on their mind. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the climate crisis has brought a lot of young people into the environmental movement. Yeah, I was going to say I'm surprised that it's an older supporter that, you know, is, is the more typical, but I guess it, it's a financial element as well. Well, I, I should clarify, older donors, the donor older base donors, is older. Yeah. Right, Supporters okay. and volunteers and yeah. petition signers run the gamut. Um, yeah, of course. But... So that's that's where that stands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it must be absolutely fascinating, and it is. It's also just from the sort of uh, not profits that we work with, trying to keep it kind of fresh with the fundraising, with the data, and when you're up against things like COVID, and then you know, I I guess probably in America as well, but certainly in the UK, we've been hit by a cost of living crisis. So donation is always kind of the first thing that people unfortunately will kind of cut back on. So I guess using the data to try and get kind of interesting insights and try and just think of it in a fresh way is your yeah. team's pretty indispensable yeah we are we don't set strategy but we do want to inform yeah the folks that do and and one other piece of the puzzle here in america that has definitely changed in my lifetime is that we are now in a continual election cycle yeah used to be that nonprofit fundraising would dip for important presidential elections and then it would come back up for the next two three years I mean, we are, we are constantly, people are constantly running for office and they're getting all the attention. Mm. Um, presidents, Trump's election, 
and then attempt at re-election mm. became just such a massive battle that it, 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 it's, it was a real challenge for non-political fundraising groups. Yes. And, and that seems the new normal now. <laughs> I mean, the, the 2022 midterms were just as important to, to try and keep control of Congress. And now we've got a presidential election that, believe it or not, has already started here. Okay. It's uh, people are already putting their hat in the ring. The fundraising has started. It's you know it, it's it's a troubling time, and so I think the challenge is to figure out what messages are resonating. Yeah, with supporters and donors that can tie into their political outrage, but also remind them that we are politics or not. We're a planet in crisis. We are an yeah. ecosystem in crisis, um, and that affects not just the environment, but it's a civil justice issue, a social justice issue. Forgive me. Yeah, of course. So there's all these pieces at work, and we just try and provide like the most real-time sort of info that we can, so that these folks can make the hard choices about how to how to pitch uh, how to pitch our message. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine it's quite difficult to um, remain impartial with the data sometimes, depending, you know, under you know, I, I, we won't get into it, but you know, under Trump and stuff, we must. There's certain ways to use data, right? I guess. <laughs> You got to uh, remain impartial, but yeah. It's, but uh, you find you find surprising things. One example that we found, which was pretty shocking to us, is we use a database that has predictive scoring. Okay. Um, how likely is this person to be a Trump supporter on a scale of zero mm. to hundred? Um, how likely is this person uh, likely to be in fear of climate change? Yeah. Or feel that it's a real issue. We looked at some of that data and we found a somewhat of a correlation and I won't remember exactly where, but it's somewhere in the U.S. where there's a really tight correlation between Trump support and climate uh, concern. Okay. And we did some digging, and when you think about it, who, who is most concerned about shrinking um, access to, to, to uh, water and to good farming? It's American farmers yeah. who tend to be conservative, tend to be rural, but they are also the ones on the front line saying that, climate change is real you know we have yeah. to do something about it so that's the other fun thing about data is you find yeah. you find things like that that you wouldn't expect yeah nice yeah i think i was definitely a big fan of uh when the sort of freakonomics thing kind of blew up and it was like ah oh, this yeah. is i mean you as an actual data person probably find all of that uh, very pop psychology but yeah as a person that isn't in data it's like oh this is so interesting there's uh, yeah. i imagine you come across quite a lot of that yeah and there's been more written um that I think has tried to bring data and information to a more understandable level. Um, yeah. That book is an example. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's work is a bit of an mm. example. Um, so there's more of that, but it's also easy to get misunderstood, as I, as I alluded to earlier. Yeah. So yeah, talk, talk more about that. Talk about the misunderstanding around data. Oh, goodness. Um, so I'll refer to a book that I think all of your listeners should check out. Mm -hmm. It's called Data Feminism. Um, the authors' names escape me, but they're uh, a, a couple of talented women who I believe are based out of New Zealand. Anyway, the, the book has a lot of wonderful arguments to it, but the biggest one to me is that it really puts to the sword this notion that big data is the best data. Okay. The more data you have, the more tables you have, the more fields and records and Google mm -hmm. Analytics pixels that you have, the better positioned you're going to be to do that work. And there's so much fallacy in that. And, and they take it apart very nicely, one by describing big data as inherently masculine. Okay. If you think about it, big, I have a big data server, I have a big <laughs> truck, I have this enormous house, you know? So g coming at things at massive scale, you know, ignores a lot of nuance. And I don't mean to make this a gendered issue, but I, I really like how they, how they approach it. You know, big data can do a lot, but it can also, it also contains a lot of bias. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Take a look at American census data. And I don't know if this is true in the UK or elsewhere throughout the world. American census data, who does it count accurately? Yeah. Homeowners, white folks, older people, people that have been in their homes more often, and you know, rural folks. Who does yeah. it not count? Black and brown folks. People who are, quote, illegal, illegally in the country, which mm -hmm. I think is a pejorative and bad word, but I'm just using it to, that's how it's positioned. Of course. People experiencing homelessness, people experiencing mental illness. So simply because you have a data set of 320 million Americans doesn't make it a good one, right? And so, yeah. You can have that data set, but 
act intelligently about it and realize that just the scale of your data is not gonna is not gonna serve you the best, right? Yeah. Um, and there's also a misconception I think about sort of predictive analytics and about how that's used. Um, okay. And it can be used in some pretty dangerous ways. There's a very famous um, incident that happened with a large American retailer. I won't say it. I say who it is, but it's easy to find if you Google it. Yeah. There was a large retailer that decided they wanted to use people's past purchasing history okay. as an indicator of how to sell to them in the mm -hmm. future. So there was a young, I think, 16-year-old girl in uh, somewhere in, in, in a small town in, in the U.S. who started getting flyers for um, pregnancy uh, supplies. Okay. Her father was naturally horrified. The girl was, it caused this enormous thing because whatever algorithm they decided to put against all this consumer data mm. decided that this girl was about to or had become pregnant. Wow. I mean, and that's, that's something that in the end, you know, probably caused a stir in the family and probably caused a lawsuit, but it didn't cause as much harm. But think about how much harm that could cause if you took that in other directions, right? If you took that in the healthcare direction, if you took yeah. that in other ways. Um, so that's, what, that's, I think, the biggest misunderstanding is thinking also, and that also applies to, wow, you're Greenpeace, you must have this enormous data set of this mm. and that. I wish we could do the same work. Um, you hear that from smaller groups a lot. And towards that end, we put together, we just did our third year of it, something called the Data Activist Co-op, okay. where we invited data professionals, um, activists, large and small, not just in the eco space, but in any other space they wanted and we shared a lot of these tools and insights and I think the one lesson from it is that maybe more so than ever access to information while still difficult and still controlled by people with power is possible and is accessible and the tools to analyze that data are more in non-professionals hands which I think is great yeah um, we talked to the young woman who is a solo activist who is trying to prevent evictions in Florida Okay. And she somehow got access to this amazing data set about the disparity between, you know, evictions were happening to black and brown folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the two things. One, that big data is not always best. And the second yeah. thing is, you know, you don't have to be an organization at the size and scale of ours or even bigger to make really good use of data and to, and to make change. Yeah. That's a long-winded answer, right, Paul? No, I love it. It's super interesting. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's um, like you say... The size of it, the kind of conflating, just because there's a lot of it, meaning that it's it's good per se, I guess, because um, it can be that can be super blunt if you've just got a load of it and it's like you say, kind of missing the nuance. And if you're using it as support rather than illumination, so it's just kind of you can take whatever you whatever data. If you've got enough data, presumably you can carve out something to support pretty much anything. <laughs> Absolutely, and and big data, like I said, has an inherent bias towards the towards the majority. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you're not going to get, like, if you look at big box retailers, they're not going to capture the buying habits of folks that you mm. know, can't afford to go to those places or go more to local places. And so that, again, inherently biases towards, you know, the folks who, who are able to provide that data and who have credit cards. You know, people who pay cash yeah. for things are not included in a data set, excuse me, um, you know, that would show data that would help someone with their buying habits and that extends to things like healthcare. You know, folks yeah. uh, who have to pay their urgent care in cash aren't included in data sets about the health of a community. So. Yeah. And of course the danger of that comes from when the data is used to sort of introduce policy and make laws and things that then affect the kind of wider society and then it becomes systemic and it does. Yeah. It does. So. Um, you know, and combine that with the fact that there are data sets out there that people don't want in the hands of mm. the, quote, average person. Um, you know, municipalities have data that they, you know, for various reasons, for privacy reasons and so forth, but they also have data that makes policy look bad. Yeah. And so they're not going to give it away. And corporations certainly and fossil fuel companies aren't giving data away unless they're unless they are uh, <laughs> made to, uh, yeah. you know, in, in a court. Um so yeah, I, th I think just keeping that in mind as a data professional and as just anyone at large, like know what the source of the data is, know what the point of view of who's providing mm. it and know how it's being presented. There's so, m I mean, we could talk about um, data visualizations 
for an hour because there's <laughs> so much art and science and opinion to it that people yeah. don't realize. You look at a graph in a newspaper, that graph could have been put together any of 40 different ways that would tell a slightly different story. So. Yeah, with extremely uh, small text to say how big right. the data source was and where it's coming exactly. from. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely one of those things whenever you're looking at something that has data, particularly when it's the more kind of shocking, standout things, you have to think about, you have to be curious about it and think, well, what are they, what do they want me to think when I'm looking at this? What are, exactly. you know, what are they trying to achieve and, and why would this person want to achieve that? And yeah, I think it can make you quite a uh, sort of <laughs> cynical, but maybe, maybe that curious is probably a kinder word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think at my age at this point, it, it, it <laughs> makes me extremely frustrated when I see, um, you know, and, and by well-meaning people too, uh, you know, by, by bad-meaning people, it makes me outraged, but by well-meaning people, it just makes me sigh. Um, you know, when I see a bar graph, I saw one the other day, a bar graph of uh, an opinion survey among various departments, mm. um, you know, so I'll make up departments, you know, the finance department had a, had a uh, feedback score of 4.7 right. and I noticed that the I don't know the widget department had a feedback score of 4.0 I said well how many people did you interview in the widget department uh, just one <laughs> I'm like one person is not its own bar graph That's, yeah uh, that doesn't, so, one person anyway. does not a bar graph make yeah. there's um I will probably edit this bit out because I don't think you can advertise other podcasts on your podcast but uh, there's a great podcast called if books could kill um oh. And it's really good. I mean, it's it's pretty kind of pop culture, but it's uh, these two guys, and they they do look into books like Freakonomics, um, Outliers, Nudge, and they kind of um, they don't tear them apart, but they kind of challenge it, and they look at things, and they look at particular studies, and they say, well, that had an I think it's an N group or something that had like mm -hmm. four participants, or they didn't look into the fact that these participants had this background or whatever, and it's it's just it's if you're into data um, yep. and kind of being a bit skeptical. That sounds um, great. It's really good. And one of them has a background in law, so he's got, you know, it's just, it's a whole thing. It's quite political. It's quite good fun. But yeah, yeah. I'd recommend it. If books could kill. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Uh, I mean, speaking about law, I, I recently got a law degree from the University of I London. I saw um, And that, I, you know, I, I'm not going to switch careers and become a lawyer, but doing that work just informed a lot of my own work so much. Yeah. And I talked about, you know, in some of the particular cases about how lawyers, solicitors, barristers, how legal professionals can take data and use it to say something else completely yeah. um, and do it in a, in a legal sense. Um, and, uh, and it's one of those things that I remember talking to somebody is like, that's one of the biggest problems in trial law is mm. having two experts go up against one another, both with the same credentials, both with the same data set and able to say two completely different things. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, so that, again, uh, people looking at information, how it's presented, who's presenting it, mm. why they're doing it, and I think you got it exactly right. What are they wanting me to think? Yeah, right. it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Like, that's a really good example of the fact that, like you say, it's the same case, but with totally different um, kind of perspectives. And you're doing your second master's, I believe, from, again, creepy LinkedIn stalking. <laughs> uh, d doing it very slowly, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to get an LLM in uh, environmental law in particular, because okay. obviously that's uh, where I'd like to stay. But that's a, uh, you know, it's all by remote learning. It's at your own pace, which right now yeah. the, pace is, the pace is slow. But um, I'm really I hoping mean, to, uh, you know. to keep going with it. Yeah, you've got, you've got other stuff on your plate. Yeah, I did wonder, because it's uh, the, it's, is it Queen Mary? That you're doing the it was University of London, wasn't it? And then right, Mary. it was through their um, their distance program. Yeah, that's uh, really great, cool. Great, great program, and for me, it worked really well. You know, just reading and talking mm. to classmates. There weren't there weren't online classes or anything like that. So it's just okay. read for nine months and then take an exam. So nice. it was, I was okay with that. Yeah, I think it's um, those distance courses. I did a, a systems thinking course for MIT, but online. Um, oh yeah, but that was. Yeah, that was tough because it was, because it, you don't have the pressures of going to classes and sort of doing stuff. And you're like, I have to do it myself. And then did the classic kind of, at, exactly as I did at uni the first time around, waited and kind of had to do the, the last <laughs> dissertation bit in the final couple of weeks. But yeah, it's, um, I think having, because obviously with the role that you're in and then doing a legal, having that kind of lens on it, that's really, that's really interesting. Very diligent 
And is it just kind of uh, just interested and just kind of casually getting a law masters on the side? Or? Uh, I mean, it's it's. I'm hoping it's more than interest. Like I said, I'm not suddenly going to apply to our legal team, but I think um, <laughs> you know, in, in my work, for example, I review a lot of contracts. Yeah. Um, uh, Greenpeace is the target of lawsuits constantly by bad actors. Um, sure. Folks that want to, uh, you know, just irritate us, and so we <laughs> provide data for that uh, for discovery. So it's it's helpful to have the background. Um, yeah. You know, my my partner makes fun of me. She's like, "Well, so what's next? Dentistry? <laughs> I'm going to taxidermy school or That's something it, like that?" Yeah. I said, "No, I think I'm done. I think I'm I'm good for now." So. I think you know, sort of that kind of level of role and then a casual couple of masters. I think you can probably relax after that. Maybe just, maybe <laughs> just, be fine. you know, calm down. Um, okay. And so obviously we, we talked about um, the, the book that you mentioned earlier. Were there any other examples um, within the industry of kind of particular tech for good? Oh, has my microphone just come out? No, there we go. Uh, yeah. Any other examples of kind of tech for good or anything that you are kind of excited about in the technical space that's coming up with Greenpeace that you can talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think we are pivoting strategy a bit in terms of, you know, our campaigns and what we're going after. I mean, obviously, fossil fuels has become, mm -hmm. you know, a, not one more drop is kind of our mantra at this point. Okay. Um, so we're really trying to get creative with regard to alternative energy. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to get creative with alternative energy sources. Mm -hmm. with how we convince folks not to have this love affair with fossil fuels. So how do you attack that from a data perspective? And there's just so many data sets out there. I think that's the exciting thing for us. Um, mm. We're part of a cooperative, and I can say who it is. It's called the Movement Cooperative, okay. um, based in the U.S., but I believe they have international members as well. And it's this cooperative of, I don't even know how many organizations now, big and small, that share data with one another. Mm -hmm. They pool their resources together so that they can get access to things like voter file data. And there are so many new tools out there that all sorts of data management manipulation. Um, when I was learning data visualization, I think there were like three tools. Okay. There was Tableau, which is obviously still around, a couple others. I can't even, we, we did a, a request for possibly changing our existing one. I can't even tell you how many we looked at. <laughs> I mean, there had to be 20, but and they were all excellent. Yeah. Um, so that to me is one of the more exciting things is just more people creating really interesting tools. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, they're not tools that cost, you know, an IBM computer 30 years ago cost <laughs> $10,000, right? So yeah. we're not at that scale. So there are tools out there that my single person activist can can buy and use on her home laptop and have access to an enormous data set and have access to peers and to others who will you know give instruction on how to do that so accessibility i think is the biggest yeah. thing in tech for good right now um pulling back the curtain on some of the folks that have data and are unwilling to share it yeah um again we do a lot of public shaming of corporations and of nice. governments um you know, what are you hiding? Why are you hiding it? We didn't know this existed before. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's the biggest thing. Nice. And again, you don't have to be an organization the size of a Greenpeace or a United Way or any of a hundred others that are that are large scale to be able to do this kind of work. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is the data will be so important to empowering people that actually if you have you know the knowledge, then you can actually do something, and it doesn't have to be these big kind of sweeping changes it doesn't always have to be policy although obviously that is important um you know the impact that it can have on an individual can be just as worthwhile doing as long as you know what you're doing and you have the data um, yeah. then it can be supported and and not to throw a fly in the ointment but i can i answer the question you didn't ask which is what are you what are you concerned about in terms yeah. of tech for good and mm -hmm. i don't think it'll surprise anyone that you know generated AI right now is yeah. <laughs> an enormous, I don't know what it is except to say, a friend of mine tested this the other day, you can literally say, I don't know, I don't remember the exact prompt, but draw me a graph that shows me that one and one does not equal two. Oh, Something yeah. like that. Draw me a graph that shows me that Donald Trump's presidency was immensely popular. 
things like that. I mean, and that stuff is going to get published. It's going to get, yeah. you know, because it's not drawn necessarily on factual data. It's drawn on just whatever is out there and whoever's yeah. shouting the loudest, right? Um, and there are a lot of good people, I think, who are trying to put checks and balances on generated AI. Um, and it's the generated part that is really the troublesome part. I mean, artificial intelligence is a massive tool and, mm. and has been used for so much good. But when you, when you just trust it to produce something for you without really questioning where it's coming from, yeah, that's going to be a huge issue moving forward. Definitely. Well, the tech itself is agnostic, right? Like it can be used for good or bad, but it's the fact yeah. that it's going to people that will then use it for bad. And, and all the kind of inherent, like we talked about earlier, the inherent bias and things. So whoever's building the systems that then generate the content, if you ask them, like, oh, what's the state of this? show data that does it then it's going to have all of that bias kind of in there and then yeah nothing to kind of um challenge it and, and just the volume of it as well how can you possibly regulate if there's that much data being generated that's just yeah. false and then turned into these infographics that like you say go to the the louder sites and things well the equivalent i make which may seem kind of odd is online reviews yeah, right? on, yeah. people look at online reviews and i do this even knowing what how awful they are when mm -hmm. you look up a restaurant on Google the first thing it shows you is how many stars it has but everyone knows that the people that yell the loudest are the people that are unhappy yeah right so you can have and reviews have been weaponized yeah if you're a business that annoys a certain community or group mm -hmm. of people they will give you 10,000 bad reviews in a minute using bots and using all of that so yeah where generated AI comes into the picture is it doesn't know it doesn't know how to weed out that chaff versus mm. what's meaningful. Um, so that's what your point about it being kind of used for good or bad. The problem is the data source that it relies on might inherently be non-factual. Right? Yeah. It might be just the people that you know. Show me the worst restaurant in Baltimore. Well, it picks the one that had. 60 bad reviews because they hung a pride flag outside their yeah restaurant. so that that's that's the troubling part um, yeah. i'm not sure i'd want to be 20 years old at this point <laughs> so, to yeah. have six to have 60 more years of this as opposed to however many i've got um, yeah i but, mean there's a lot of reasons to not want to be 20 anymore but yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, it is, uh, it's, I think it can be quite overwhelming when you especially and you must have this as well working in the environmental sector it's you start sort of looking at things and it, it can get pretty um, depressing pretty quickly and kind of you can feel a little bit hopeless. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you a, a difficult question now in terms of can you leave us on a, a positive data insight note to make everyone feel like there is hope? Absolutely. Well, there's two things I think of in particular. One is that who a data professional is is totally different than when I first started doing tech work, let's mm -hmm. say 20 years ago. Um, it is no longer male dominated. Um, yeah. it, I think it's not diverse enough, but I think that the efforts are very strong to get more uh, black and brown folks and, mm -hmm. and women into the STEM space. I think the effort that was made at least here in the US and probably worldwide, you know, maybe 10 years ago to have, you know, young children get more interested in yeah. careers and fields they weren't normally, I think is bearing fruit. Like when we put out for a position, we see a, a much, much more diverse set of technical folks which is wonderful because yeah. it as we say um there's a talking head song that has a line that says facts all have a point of view facts don't do what i want them to nice. um so same with day i may be mangling that so sorry david. <laughs> sorry david byrne if i mangled that i apologize um but it's true though i mean the people that work with data shouldn't just be yeah i'll be quite honest they shouldn't be just the people who look like me sure um they should come with all sorts of different perspectives. And I think we're seeing that now. Yeah. Um, I see it in the people I work with directly. I see it when I work with other data teams throughout the, the social and environmental justice space. So that's heartening. Um, the second thing that's heartening is that more people are understanding what information can do, mm -hmm. right? And I think we talked about the bias that can be used for bad, but I think awareness of that bias is becoming a lot more mainstream yeah. so people are looking at things with a, some people are looking at things <laughs> with a more critical eye um, people on both sides of the political spectrum can be blind to you know anything but their own spot we're all sure. guilty of that at some point 
Um, but that to me is also very heartening. And then the, again, what I went when I talked about earlier is accessibility to information and accessibility to tools. To me, that's again very, very much a cause for optimism as well. Nice. Well, lovely. Well, thank you, and lovely to end on a positive note. <laughs> it's easy, sure. to, easy to not. But thank you so much for your time today. It was really interesting to talk to you, and yeah. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. So, it's thank been you a so pleasure. Much.